Ruanda, Albania und eine pure andere Erde. Mhm. Du ja. die, die Juden, wo sie in Griechenland noch in Stadt und sie gekommen. Ja, und sie haben äh, sehr spezielle äh, Musik äh, mit Säure. Sie, äh, ich habe ge, hab sich gelernt, äh, sehr äh, Mao Zor, eine äh, Version von äh, mhm. Mao Zor ist es. Uh, in this, yeah, it's clinked as I the Greekish, a Greekish stam. Um, they they flagging when in oich in Turkey is, uh, over they sein in uh, intergemischt mit the Svardische Hospo and sein in mehr nicht uh, Romanian. Und sag wir sind, ob es auch assimiliert sind, verschwinden. Ja, 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 assimiliert nicht verschwinden. Du sagst, die Romanioten sind sie verschwinden, die Menschen sind sie versteht sich nicht verschwinden. Ja. Du siehst der Nomen von den Jeden von der, von der römischen Imperie. Ah. Also die byzantinische Jeden. Mhm. Haben Sie gehört, äh, sehr eigene Sprache eurer Jüdisch? Ja, wir haben gehört, meine Mama hat gehört, äh, Jüdisch und Griechisch, ja. Wow. So do knock out a, a Yiddish Griechish shield of the Lower East Side in, of Broome Street in New York. Wow. Oh yeah? Yeah. So Klein, and this is not a not a shul in Yerushalayim. So do in Yerushalayim, so do three or the four in in Yisrael. So do in Yanina, dort in my my Mishpucha stammt in Yanina, in in nicht weit von Albania. So do in Chotch uh, Eins uh, in America in New York in. Zwei oder drei in, in, in Israel. Es wow. so, 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 so ist ein ganzer Meister für eine äpfere Zukunft. Äh, 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 Alexia, ja. Ja, ja. ja MS, MS. So sehr ja. interessant. Äh, sehen die die Griechen, aber wo sind wir geblieben? Farde Mochumme? Wo sind noch gewesen in Griechenland? Farde Mochumme? Zu nehmen. Ja, du siehst. Als Sachsen weg in Amerika oder in Isu oder andere Länder vor dem Rumme, die, wo sind dort geblieben, die, 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 die Deutschen haben uns gehalten, die Matale. Die Matale, ja. Herr, äh, ich meine 90 Prozent. Okay. Aber die, wo sind geblieben, sind du noch aus in Janina in Athens. Mhm. Ähm, der Bürgermeister von, von Janina ist ein Jid. Wow. Heiliger Bürgermeister. Ja. Ist ab und zu mehr sehr mein Zakurev. Oh ja? Aber ja, es ist, aber das ist eine Seltenheit. Es ist nur so ja. wenig Jeden in Griechenland, wenn man hat einen Bürgermeister, wo es ist ein Jeden. Ja, ja, oh. das ist, wow. Okay, <lacht> ja, es ja, ja, ist noch Alexia, aber noch mehr, noch mehr Maske ja. entfernen. <lacht> Absolut. Oh, aber jetzt ist, uh, ist Kimat Elfersäger, und ich will uh, hey on mit uh, Start Webinar, ich will give a quitsch. Do and go. Yeah. Awesome. It's automatic. Uh, and they're coming in. Let me share my screen. Oops. Make that. Uh, okay. Good. Oops, that's not what I wanted. No, anyway. That's it. Yeah, that should be good. Okay. 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 So I think people are coming in. Yeah, I will wait a minute, say, later even on. Um, uh, Uh, aber Zach, ist da Q&A ergibt von hinten? Uh, ja, es ja, soll sein. Um, aber ich kann nicht. Um, mm. um, interessant. In Sekunde, ich muss... Um, Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, it's right here. The Q and A. Yeah, we have Q and A. Oh. Oh. Hey. Okay, yeah. after, after die was um, seinen gekommen, können schreiben rein uh, in Q&A. Ja, sie können nicht in Chat, wenn es ist. Ja, sie können schreiben on in uh, Chat und euch in, in Q&A. In Chat euch? In Chat, okay. ja, oh, yes, beide. Okay. Oh, ja, ich habe die Woche gedacht, du hast mir nur gewähnt, dass ich in Winnipeg Sie ja. gegangen in der ganzen Schmiss wegen Winnipeg. Ja. Okay, so ich meine, es ist schon äh, etliche Minuten noch zwei, äh, also noch elf, noch zwei. Ich meine, als die, die sind gekommen, ob ihr wollt da reinschreiben in den Chat, von wann denn ihr stammt. So, um, I'm, before we start our formal greeting, I just want to say that those of you who are here uh, already joining us, you, if, you, if you like, you can uh, give us a shout out and where you're from, you can write in in the chat and uh, share that, right? Everyone can see the chat, Zach, yes? Yeah, everyone can see the chat. So, so you can write and, in and, now. And people are starting to write into the Q&A as well. Okay. Wow. Great. Oh, someone from Vilna. Hey, must like stamp from Vilna. Yeah, fantastic. Mein schwerer Sadilne. <laughs> Haifa on Ottawa on Long Beach on Toronto, Ithaca, Tarzana, California, Los Angeles, Montreal. Wow, wow, wow. Deutschland, Düsseldorf on Culver City on on also weiter. Okay, so if we uh if we should say this before me, then in uh, over the name of Shine Ibel Hindel, Zach, uh, Hindel and Fussik. They are fine, okay. Yeah, we're all in uh, Haven on Bot Shine. Yeah, good, we're Haven on, okay. The so, Super Bowl that's a good thing. Yeah, we don't say that. Yeah, this is. Okay, Alice. So, um, so can you make a uh, speaker view, Zach, as you will be in place? Yeah. You are. You are the uh, when the attendees watch, they only will see speakers. Okay. Great. Great. So, uh, Shalom Aleichem, everyone. Welcome. Thank you all for joining us today. Herzlichen Dank für Sie sind mit uns heint. We are absolutely delighted to have such a large turnout for Dr. Kalman Weiser's talk, New and Old Theories About the Origins of Yiddish and Ashkenazic Jews. My name is Miri Korl, and as director of the California Institute for Yiddish Culture and Language, I've had the privilege over the last 20 plus years of introducing hundreds of topics and speakers every one of which revealed a different and unique facet of the astonishingly rich Yiddish heritage. But today's topic, uh, if today's topic isn't loaded, I don't know what is. <laughs> it gets right to the kishkis of where our language came from and even deeper where the largest percentage of Jews who are associated with this language came from. And like all Jewish topics that are deeply important and involve at least a millennium and more of spotty history, we already know there are, how shall I put it, passionate differences of opinion. I don't know about you, uh, but I'm very much looking forward to hearing about them and which one won out and why. We have people, as we saw, people joining us from many places across North America and the globe. 
And so please feel free to type into the chat uh, where you're joining us from uh, and, and we'll all uh, be able to ship naches von dem. We're aware that you can watch the recording another time and maybe that's what you're doing down the road. But even though we can't see each other, there's a certain positive energy in watching something live with over a hundred like-minded people watching with you. So thank you all so much for being with us at this moment today. I'm very grateful for the co-sponsorship of the Toronto UJA Committee for Yiddish, especially my counterpart, Vivian Felsen, as well as Del Nistel, Los Angeles, for being our Zoom webinar host, uh, and Zachary Golden in particular, who's behind the scenes uh, technical director. None of this would be possible without the support of uh, California Yiddish Institute donors and members. And I wanna thank all those who've given your support. We don't make too many appeals. As you may have noticed, your inbox is not flooded with requests for donations. Uh, and if you value programs such as the, these that inspire all of us with the complexity and creativity of Yiddish culture, please do consider visiting the Cycle website and clicking on the membership donate button. Our speaker today, Professor Kahneman Weiser, will be speaking for about 40, 45 minutes, and then we'll have about 15 minutes for questions. So please type any questions into the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and we'll try to get to as many as possible. So to introduce our speaker, Professor Weiser is the Silber Family Professor of Modern Jewish Studies and is currently the Acting Director of the Koshitsky Center for Jewish Studies at York University in Toronto. The latest book he edited is Key Concepts in the Study of Antisemitism, and other books include Jewish People, Yiddish Nation, Noah Prilutsky and the Folkists in Poland, uh, published in 2011, which explores the rise and fall of the nationalist movement on behalf of Yiddish in Russia and Poland until World War II. Uh, he also edited Yiddish, a survey and a grammar. Uh, and he recently completed a book manuscript about Max Weinreich and Solomon Bimbaum and their German colleagues who became Nazis. Uh, this book is uh, I think maybe still tentatively titled uh, Confronting Hitler's Professors, Yiddish Scholars, and the Holocaust. Some of which, some of this topic, you'll be privy to in Dr. Weiser's third and final talk in our series on March 13th at this same time, uh, which is entitled Take uh, Milern do Yiddish, or better known as the astonishing history and future of Yiddish in universities. So now it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Kalman Weiser. Thank you very much for the kind words. Um, I'm going to just share my screen, so bear with me for a moment. Okay, you can see the screen. Yeah, Zach nods. Okay, fantastic. Okay, so welcome everybody. Thank you for making time in your day to hear me. I understand I have to finish before the Super Bowl starts or Eric Cam in North York, Ontario will be very angry with me. I can't promise you, however, that there will be a halftime show. So I'm gonna talk for about 45 minutes about the history of the history of Yiddish. That is research about where Yiddish and Ashkenazic Jews come from and the political uh, ramifications of this, how the subject has been politicized over the last several decades. The uh, Actually, the picture you see in front of you on my opening screen is a lecture for, I wrote a book about Noah Prilutsky, who was an important Yiddish scholar and Jewish politician in Poland. He was actually the chair of Yiddish at the University of Vilnius in, 19, in the early 1940s until the Germans came and killed him. Um, but I'm not going to talk about that. I'm just going to point out that the title of his lecture is God's Yiddish and wie sei es verstanden geworden? That is God's Yiddish and how was Yiddish 
how did it originate? This was an important topic before World War II, and this is an important topic going back centuries, as I'll explore with you today. It continues to be discussed today. Some of you might be familiar that there's actually an argument being made amongst politicians in Germany nowadays about considering Yiddish a minority language in Germany, part of the German language and cultural sphere as a part of an attempt to win um, rights for Jewish immigrants for the Soviet Union from the Soviet Union who now live in Germany. But this is only the most recent iteration of debates about Yiddish. Perhaps it drew your attention only a few years ago that in 2016, an argument was brought by two scholars working with some others, uh, most prominently a man named uh, El Chaik, um, and another scholar, Paul Wexler, the first is an Israeli scholar working in Britain. Paul Wexler is an American scholar who's lived in Israel for years. They made an argument based on linguistic and genetic evidence suggesting that the Ashkenazic Jew, that Yiddish is really a relaxified Slavic language. I'll explain what that means later, but essentially that's a Slavic language whose vocabulary changed and that the Ashkenazic Jews descend, are the descendants of Khazars. Uh, that is a um, kingdom in Central Asia that ceased to exist around the 10th century that I'll talk to you about more later. This is a theory that's not new. There have been various versions of this theory going on since the 19th century. But what they brought to it was new, were new linguistic arguments and new genetic arguments, most of which have been thoroughly, how shall I say, either discredited or rejected by the community, community of scholars today. But it's a very interesting theory that we'll explore toward the end of today's lecture. So I'd like to begin by talking a little bit about the question of who Jews are. There are many groups to whom Jewish identity has been attributed, who have claimed it, or whose Jewish identity has been denied for very interesting reasons. What I'm simply showing you here on the map is what you're probably familiar with. This is ancient Israel and Judah, the two states with, a, with two peoples who shared a common religious and culture and linguistic culture. People who, as far as we understood, saw themselves as branches of the same family. Uh, today's Jews understand themselves as descendants of the people of Judah. And according to our understanding, the descendants of the people of Israel, the people of the north, the so-called 10 tribes, disappeared into history. You ended up with the two tribes essentially in the south of the 12 tribes of Israel, those who became the Judeans and then later became the Jews. Now, this is likely familiar to you, that all Jews today claim descent from the Judeans. Now, why do I have this list? Well, here's something interesting. You're probably familiar with Ashkenazic Jews. Ashkenazic Jews assume that the descendants of the Judeans, and usually this has been attributed to them, until a few centuries ago, we'll see in a second, that people have begun to deny that the Ashkenazic Jews are the descendants of Judeans. Then there's another subgroup of Ashkenazic Jews, the Hungarian Jews. In the 19th century, arguments began to be made that the Hungarian Jews were not actually Ashkenazic Jews. That is, they're not the descendants of Judeans, they were people who came from Central Asia. Perhaps they were the descendants of the Khazars. The, the importance of this or the attractiveness of this theory in the 19th century was just as the Hungarians, the Hungarian non-Jews draw their ancestry from Central Asia, so too the Hungarian Jews draw their ancestry from Central Asia. And therefore they're not related to those horrible Polish and Galician Jews just across the border would be been moving into Hungary in the course of the 19th century. It was a way of asserting an identity that was separate from the rest of Ashkenazi Jews. And this is, as we say in Yiddish, nishkeshtaigen, nishkefleigen. These Jews were basically largely Jews coming from elsewhere in the Ashkenazi territory. And many of them were former Galician Jews or former Polish Jews. But this became an important tenant in certain circles of Hungarian Jews in the late 19th century as Hungarian Jews were acculturating, wanted to show their patriotism, wanted to show how Hungarian they were. And of course, the ironic way of showing that you're Hungarian is to show that your ancestry comes from Central Asia. Of course, the Hungarian language comes from further east than Europe. We also have the case of the Lithuanian Karaites. Uh, there's a history of Karaites in the Russian Empire, at least in the 19th century, claiming that they're not the descendants of Jews. For those of you who aren't so familiar with the Karaites, 
Karaites are the non-rabbinic Jews. They break off in the Middle East around, excuse me, around the ninth century or so. Um, they're the original Jewish fundamentalists. They argue that they believe in the Torah, but not the Talmud. That the Talmud, the rabbinic writings about discussions and then later writings about the Torah are a man-made creation. They're not God-given. They rejected the idea of the oral Torah as accepted by rabbinic Jews. These people, or rather their descendants, settled around the world over the centuries. Some of them made their way to Eastern Europe, including the Lithuania area. In the 19th century, because of discrimination against Jews in the Russian Empire, the argument was made that the Karaites are actually the descendants of converts coming from elsewhere. They're not the descendants of Judeans. Therefore, they shouldn't be subject to the laws, the discriminatory laws that affect the Jews of Russia. When the Nazis arrived in Vilna area during World War II, uh, an argument was made successfully that the Karaites should be spared precisely because they were not racial or ethnic Jews. Unfortunately, uh, even in fact, Ashkenazic scholars helped to make this argument, uh, people working for YIVO, the Yiddish Scientific Institute in Vilna, because they wanted to save lives. Unfortunately, the Karaite uh, leadership did not extend the same, how should I say, favor to the Ashkenazi Jews. Sephardic Jews, arguments have been made that the Sephardic Jews are the descendants of converts, uh, particularly Berbers, who then moved into Spain. So there's a history of this also. Of course, there are the descendants of conversos, Jews who were obliged to convert to Christianity in Spain and Portugal, who later settled in other parts of the world, particularly the Americas. Uh, some of them have been rediscovering a Jewish ancestry nowadays, in fact, the state of Israel has been encouraging them to adopt normative rabbinic practice and sometimes to convert to Judaism. And some people have, in fact, become Jews and moved to Israel based on family traditions suggesting Jewish ancestry. They pursued this and immersed themselves in Judaism. There are tribes in Africa. I don't mean Ethiopian Jews. I mean other tribes, a number of tribes who have since the 19th century increasingly claimed descendant uh, Jewish ancestry some of whom have also adopted rabbinic Jewish practice today, some of whom have also moved to some extent to Israel. Here in North America, what we call the First Nations in Canada, which I think in the United States you call Native Americans, uh, there is a history of assuming that these people are also the descendants of Jews or that they're the descendants of the lost tribes of Israel, the 10 lost tribes. Uh, this has also been largely debunked, but it's an interesting story. We don't have time to talk about how these ideas came about, why various groups have decided they were Jews when centuries ago they didn't have a knowledge or a sense of them being Jews. And that can go on and on. There are other groups, too, about whom Jewish identity has been claimed and the groups that have dissociated themselves from Jewish identity or who assert a Jewish identity today. I'm, of course, going to focus on the Ashkenazic Jews, but it's no less politicized who they are. OK, what I'm showing you here is a map of medieval Europe seen through Jewish eyes. Um, before there was an Ashkenaz, which really refers to southern Germany, and then only later becomes to refer to the, the people from southern Germany who moved further east into Eastern Europe. Before there was a cultural group called the Ashkenazic Jews, there were simply Jews in this part of the world. Um, these are the various names that Jews in Europe in the medieval period assigned to territories. Usually these are names taken from the Bible, either because of a sound correspondence or because of a correspondence in meaning. So for example, the Slav Jews of the Slavic lands, we know that before Ashkenazic Jews came to Eastern Europe, there were Jews living in, let's say, Czech territory, perhaps Ukraine. We know this from names. We know this from tombstones, or from some other sources. They spoke a Slavic language. This territory was called Canaan by Jews. And they spoke the language of Canaan, which is a Slavic language. Uh, why is it called Canaan by Jews? Most probably because we know that slaves were taken from this part of the world. And there's a reference to this Canaanite slave in the Bible. And from this, it was generalized, this, you know, the correspondence, the Canaanite slave, 
this is where the slaves are in Eastern Europe. They called this place Canaan in the rabbinical imagination. Uh, Tzolfas in modern Hebrew Tzolfat is another example. It's somewhere in the Bible, somewhere north of the land of Israel, uh, as is Ashkenaz, as a descendant of Noah. These are all reassigned, Sepharad, they're all assigned to the map of Europe. Uh, Hogar, Hagar, right, becomes Hungary, right? And this goes back centuries. Okay. Ashkenazic Jews, as you know, start off sometime about a thousand years ago with Jews moving into German territory. Eventually, at some point, they become perceived as this culturally distinct. In the beginning, they're speaking the language of Ashkenaz. We don't know how different this is from the language of non-Jews, and we'll talk about this a little bit later. That's a very significant point. How different is it, and how much do we know about it? Over time, though, we do know that Jews from Central Europe will take their language and their culture, and they will move further east into the territory of Canaan and Hogo. And this will become part of what I call Ashkenaz II. Ashkenaz I being basically South and Western Germany, Ashkenaz II being uh, Eastern Europe. We might say that North America to a certain extent is Ashkenaz III, because so many Ashkenazic Jews bring their culture and language here in North America beginning in the late 19th century. Okay. What is Yiddish? Um, well, this is all a little bit of background. First of all, I'll point out the geographic expanse of what we call Yiddish. Um, today's Yiddish, we really mean the Yiddish of Eastern Europe, what scholars would call Eastern Yiddish. This is the living language that you all know. What people are usually less familiar with is West Yiddish or Western Yiddish. This is a Yiddish that was essentially dying out by the late 19th and the early 20th century. So effectively, it's not died out completely by now, except for a few vestiges in the speech of perhaps some people. It was the Yiddish that was spoken in Alsace, uh, southwestern Germany, a few other areas. But Yiddish, both the Western and Eastern Yiddish, was spoken basically from Alsace in this most Western point up into um, you know, the Low Countries, all the way into Northern Italy in the early modern era, and of course, deep into Eastern Europe in the modern era. And then it was carried the Eastern branch around the world in the late 19th and the 20th centuries. Uh, Eastern Yiddish has three major dialects that I'll remind you of in just a moment. We popularly call them Northeastern or Lithuanian, uh, Central or Polish, and Southeastern Ukrainian. And this is simply what these maps are showing you here. There's a tremendous amount of continuity between these dialects. Just to illustrate the dialects, and I'm here, I'm just talking about Eastern European Yiddish, the Yiddish you're probably familiar with. Litvish Yiddish, the, the main difference between the dialects of Eastern European Yiddish is to be found in vowels, right? The consonants are pretty much the same. The uh, grammatical differences are small and they're not going to concern us here. One grammatical difference would be, for example, different uses of gender. But I'm going to focus on pronunciation. Uh, the Litvox, the, this is really the Jews of today's Lithuania, uh, northern Ukraine, Belarus, around that territory, would say, the Polish Jews, and this is true of the Galician Jews too, who speak, you know, essentially the same dialect, have Fleisch mit Beine, Arankimin, Boach, Heuch, Dertug. And the Ukrainian Jews, it's really a sort of a compromised dialect. Have Fleisch mit Beine, Aran, Arankimin, Boach, Hoch, Heuch, and Dertug. Okay, so you can see it's how similar. And there are sub dialects of all of these. You can find various different nuances, but that's the main traits of these dialects. Now this brings us to the question, of what is Yiddish? Um, and there's a lot to be said about the names of a language. They don't tell us the full story, but they tell us something about the perception of what the language is. Yiddish, of course, means Jewish, right? What did Jews speak? They speak Yiddish. You see remnants of this, for instance, in Polish, uh, the language is some, what used to be called Chidowski, which simply means Jewish. Most Jewish languages, and there are other Jewish languages besides Yiddish, the speakers said, what do you speak? We speak Jewish, or we speak our language, something like this, 
Uh, throughout history, Ashkenazi Jews have referred to their mother tongue, their vernacular, by names such as Lushan Ashkenaz, the language of Ashkenaz, which raises questions. The language of Ashkenaz, the language of Southern Germany, or is this the language spoken beyond Southern Germany? Is this the language of everybody in Southern Germany or just the language as Jews speak it? It's a bit ambiguous. They've called it Teich, which is obviously related to the German word Deutsch. Uh, the Germans call their own language peopleish. What do you speak? We speak peopleish. We speak the language of the people. That's really what Deutsch is. Teich has the same meaning. And over time in Yiddish it becomes to, you know, Tatechin is to interpret, Tatechin something is to translate something into the spoken language, usually from Hebrew. It came to be called Mama Wushin, the mother tongue. Uh, the term Jagon began as a derogatory term, but eventually became a completely neutral term to refer to Yiddish. It's only really in the 20th century that the term Yiddish is accepted as the name that we call this language. Ironically, that has to do with English. In the United States, people started calling it Yiddish. Scholars in Eastern Europe started saying, let's call it Yiddish in scientific writing, and it eventually caught on. And now it's pretty much indisputed that Yiddish is the term for the language. Not to say that people weren't using the term Yiddish before, but that this term becoming the one generally accepted way to refer to the language, this is really a phenomenon of the 20th century. Now, as I've already made clear, I think, Yiddish is the traditional vernacular of Ashkenazi Jews, the Jews of Central and Eastern Europe. It existed in what we might call a complementary relationship with the holy language, Wushan Kaidish, the language of sanctity, that is rabbinic Hebrew, which is a mixture of Hebrew and Aramaic. So Jews spoke the, the spoken language, Yiddish, but their sacred texts, their liturgy, and anything that they really thought was important to write, like a rabbinic commentary, a biblical uh, a binding contract, this was usually written in Hebrew. Hebrew was associated with the educated male elite, but everybody was familiar with it to some extent because people prayed in it. There's lots of Hebrew words in Yiddish. It was the higher prestige language and the vernacular Yiddish was the lower prestige language, but it was everybody's mother tongue. Now, Yiddish is, of course, famously, like English, a fusion tongue, a fusion language. Most scholars would agree, and there are scholars who will differ, but most would agree that it has a primarily Germanic structure and vocabulary, but its phonology, its grammar, its vocabulary, and so on, have been influenced by the various components that contribute to it. Now, what are these components? Of course, there's Germanic. Um, our main understanding of the origins of Yiddish, most scholars would say, is that it's derived from medieval urban dialects. That is, Jews entered German-speaking territory sometime in the medieval era, again, a subject of debate when exactly and where exactly. But remember, there's no public schools. They learned Yiddish through spoken contact with urban dwellers. They were already arriving speaking other languages, and they learned, I'm sorry, not learned Yiddish, but learned some kind of German dialects from non-Jews. They were coming speaking uh, other languages. They also used Hebrew and Aramaic, Russian Kaidish, for their religious purposes. Their previous languages probably contained elements of Hebrew and Aramaic, and they were studying texts in these languages. Over time, they encountered Slavic languages. There was also a Romance influence because Jews were entering German-speaking territory from areas where Romance languages were spoken. And later on, we'll talk about an international component. And I'm going to illustrate all of this uh, in just a moment. But an international component comes, of course, mainly in the 19th and 20th centuries. You know, words like Televisia. Uh, this is, you know, in all, lang all European languages. Now, this is an artificial sentence. Uh, Max Weinreich, the famous Yiddish scholar, you know, introduced this sentence to illustrate a point. It's a rather unnatural sentence. Uh, what he was trying to show you with this is that most of the, voc most of the, the basic sentence structure here is Germanic. But not all the words are Germanic, nor could you make this quite the same sentence with German words. There are some differences in the way German works structurally than Yiddish works. Plus there's all this vocabulary that a German would not probably recognize, a German speaker that is. Um, Benchen, to bless, is a romance origin related to the word, you know, 
to like Benedict, to you know, blessed in Latin. Uh, Zayde is Slavic for grandfather. Uh, Sefer is Hebrew, but it doesn't just mean any book like modern Hebrew Sefer. It means a holy book, a religious book. Okay, so this is a very basic example of the fusion nature. I have to move my head out of the screen so I can actually see what's here. How old is this, is this language? What I'm showing you here is a, um, one of our first uh, test, testaments to the language. It's a machzer. It's a uh, holiday prayer book. Someone wrote in the Hebrew letters in Yiddish, good day to the person who carries this. Now, the question to how old is Yiddish, by the way, this is from 1272. The question is how old is Yiddish really depends on how you understand its origins. Most notably, what is its relationship to medieval German? There are people who really wish to maximize the age of Yiddish, and they bring scientific evidence in favor of this. And there are those who also with scientific arguments, you might say minimize the age of Yiddish. Um, is this what we see here being written? Is this Yiddish or is this German being written in Hebrew letters? And there's a whole debate about this. If this is the 13th century and this is Yiddish, well, certainly they don't start writing a language once they start speaking it. You've probably been speaking the language for a few generations before you start writing it. So it at least go, goes back before the 13th century. And it goes back probably before. The maximalists would argue that Yiddish is probably about a thousand years old and begins with Jews entering the Rhine Valley area of Germany. We have some information about settlement by the 10th century. There may have been settlement beforehand, but we don't have evidence. We do have evidence by the 10th century. Others would say, really, there's no evidence from this that this is any different from German being written, the local German dialect being written in Hebrew characters. I can write English in Hebrew characters. Hebrew characters alone doesn't make it a distinct language. So this is a debate. Uh, those people would usually say Yiddish starts a bit later, but everybody would agree that it's at least several centuries old. Um, the famous scholar Max Weinreich, it was attributed to him a adage that tells a lot. The adage is, or the aphorism, what's the difference between a language and a dialect? A language is a dialect with an army and a navy. Weinreich heard this, someone told it to him in a speech. He was giving a speech in New York and someone asked him this question. He thought it was a joke and the person gave him the answer and he realized this is a really good answer and he helped to popularize it. It tells us a sociological insight. That is, there's no clear scientific criteria dividing a language from a dialect. Really, this is a matter of social prestige and political and social influences. So it's really hard to get at what the actual beginnings of any language is. It's really only in retrospect that we can really either point to arguments and it has a lot more to do with how the language is viewed today. Uh, you know, why is the language of Luxembourg the official language of Luxembourg, but considered a regional dialect in Germany? This has to do with sociolinguistic factors, not with scientific factors, so to speak. Okay, now there is a very interesting history of scholarship about Yiddish. Uh, I'm gonna to talk to you next time about when Yiddish enters universities and really point to the World War II period as a time when Yiddish kind of explodes in North American universities for a number of interesting reasons. But the actual history of Yiddish scholarship goes back to the early modern period in Germany. Uh, by the way, Germany is the country that first introduced Yiddish to the university. There was uh, Yiddish courses by the 18th century in Germany, in you know, early modern universities, and the University of Hamburg introduced Yiddish in the first modern European university in 1922. Solomon Birnbaum, the famous Yiddish scholar, was the first to teach Yiddish there in 1922. So it's 100 years now since Yiddish entered a modern European university. Now, what you're seeing here are two examples, just to remind myself of what to talk about. The first is, in the, is one of the early scholars of Yiddish. Um, the early scholars of Yiddish were usually Christian theologians, Christian Hebraists. They came to understand Yiddish was a kind of bridge between German and Hebrew. 
Uh, they wanted to learn Hebrew in order to understand the Bible in its original language. They would go to Jews sometimes to become their teachers. They wanted to pass on this knowledge to their students. They believed that an effective way to teach Hebrew to students was to introduce them to Yiddish because Yiddish was written in, was like a German language, a form of German, they thought, written in Hebrew characters containing lots of Hebrew words. They also knew that Jews themselves sometimes produced glosses, like you see here. Uh, that is, Jews would make what you might call dictionaries, the difficult words in Yiddish, they'd gloss them in the kind, I'm sorry, the difficult words in Hebrew, they would gloss them in the kind of language they spoke in Yiddish. Sometimes they'd put these glosses in multiple languages side by side. So they realized this was an effective way to teach Hebrew to their students. Some of them also sought to convert Jews. The best way to convert Jews, they realized after trial and effort, which was not through Hebrew because the average Jew does not understand Hebrew. Obviously you can't reach the Jews in Latin. They were not literate in German or Latin, the average Jew. You had to reach them in the only language they knew well, and that was for the average Jew, Yiddish. So by the 1600s, the 1700s, you have books being written by Gentile scholars, guidebooks to Yiddish. You also had merchants who were writing books about Yiddish because they realized if you want to do business with Jews, you can use Yiddish from Germany all the way into Eastern Europe. You needed to understand how Jews use numbers how they wrote their business contracts, how their months work, and they produce very interesting guidebooks. This goes on really into the 19th century. In the 19th century, we even have criminologists who understood that a lot of Yiddish words and Hebrew words had entered the thieves cant in Germany. That is a language of professional criminals, which they used to you know, hide what they were doing, had Yiddish words, Hebrew words, words from other languages, because there was contact on the margins of society between Jewish criminals and non-Jewish criminals. Remember, this is all before Jews are emancipated. Once Jews begin to be emancipated in the 19th century, and they begin to acculturate, Yiddish begins its steady decline in Germany and Western Europe. And then we get a new approach to the history of Yiddish and understanding it. And that's what I'm going to take you through right now. The 19th century introduces to us what we might call the naive theories of the origins of Yiddish. The notion that Yiddish is a corrupted German. Um, very influential in spreading these ideas was the beginnings of modern Jewish scholarship, the so-called Wissenschaft des Judentums movement. Wissenschaft, which simply means the science of Jewry, was the beginning of modern secular Jewish studies writing Jewish history, linguistic studies, literary studies, and so on. From a secular critical standpoint that was being pioneered at this time in German universities. Now, this was all linked to the goal of emancipation. Remember, Jews are fighting for integration into German society. They came up with the argument that Yiddish really has to do with what you might call a fall from grace. Jews began by speaking pure German, but due to discrimination, due to their being confined in, ghetto, in ghettos by the 16th and 17th centuries, and due to their expulsions and migration to Eastern Europe, their Yiddish, well, their German declined. It became impure. It became mixed with Slavic languages and other elements. It became fossilized. And this is why we end up with Yiddish. Of course, the message behind all of this is if you free the Jews from ghettos and if you emancipate them, the Jews can return to being good Germans because once upon a time they were good Germans, they stopped being good Germans because they were discriminated against, but their, their character and their language can return to its proper German form. A counter theory emerged in what we might today call ultra-Orthodox circles, and I'm using this term a bit anachronistically. We don't use this term in the 19th century. These are traditionalists. They're very much disturbed precisely by what's going on in Central Europe. Jews are beginning to change their names, change their language, change their dress as they Europeanize in new ways on their path to emancipation and integration. In order to stop this, they want Jews to stop. Stop doing all of these things, speak Yiddish. And the argument is made that Yiddish was created by God, that God corrupted 
or mixed Gentile languages precisely in order to prevent Jews from mixing too much with non-Jews. So this is the beginning of what you might call an ultra-Orthodox series of school about the origins of Yiddish. There were by the 19, late 19th century, what you might call the anti-Semitic school of theories of Yiddish. The argument was made that Yiddish, or increasingly a Yiddish inflected German, was evidence that Jews could never acculturate or assimilate. And the reasons for this were chiefly seen as biological, okay? So in other words, Jews were acculturating, they were giving up Yiddish, but people argued that the Jews spoke German with a Yiddish accent. Even when they clearly didn't, it was often imputed to them. And sometimes, frankly, they did. This was seen as the fact that the Jews were biologically different, could never be true Germans. By the way, the picture on the left is Leopold Sunz, uh, Lippmann Sunz, who was one of the early uh, forefathers of Yiddish research and the Wissenschaft school. He was born to a traditional family, educated in traditional schools, but got a secular education. He did some of the early origin work on the origins of Ashkenazic names and the history of Yiddish. Um, but this is largely tied to, as I said, the goals of political emancipation. For him, Yiddish was something that was supposed to be left behind. It was not something to be cherished. In the late 19th into the 21st century, we get a new school of thought or schools of thought. And I'll broadly call them the Germanocentric school, the Yiddish school, and the anti Zionist school. Now, let me explain what I mean. Uh, the Germanocentric school really has to do with the rise of modern philology. And of course, Germany specializes in the 19th century in the, in the field of philology and historical linguistics. It saw in the origins of Yiddish in a Jewish colored German that grew increasingly distinct, especially in Eastern Europe. It studied it from the perspective of German linguistics. And we see this really come to its head in the case of World War I. Uh, arguments were made during World War I that the Jews of Eastern Europe were really the avant-garde or the foreposts of German culture, that they had taken their German language with them into the East, even though they were expelled, even though they had suffered at the hands of Germany because they were very much devoted to German culture, but their language had grown stultified. But we can use this language as spoken in Eastern Europe as a way of gaining insight into the developmental history of, Yiddish, of German. Therefore, this language is very valuable to us. So German linguistics in the 19th century took an interest in Yiddish as a key to understanding the history of, of the development of German over time. Many of these scholars, if not most, work with texts. They didn't actually speak Yiddish. They were usually, but not always, German-speaking Jews. They weren't Eastern European Yiddish-speaking Jews. By the late 19th century, a new school of thought develops. This is what we might call the Jewish nationalist or the Yiddish school. This movement arises in Eastern Europe toward the early 20th century. It essentially sees in Yiddish the national language of the Jews of Eastern Europe. It wants to use this argument in order to achieve rights, national recognition, the rights for state support for Jews' culture. You've perhaps heard of the Chernovitz Conference of 1908. Chernovitz is now a city in Ukraine. Then it was a city in Bukovina in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. The argument was made there that Yiddish was a national language of the Jewish people. Not the only one, but a national language. And they were so attached to this notion, in part because the way the Austro-Hungarian Empire worked was, if you could show that a, that a people had a, its own language, you can gain recognition as one of the constituent nationalities of the empire. And then the empire would have to give you certain cultural rights. So this would gain, if you can prove that Yiddish is a language, then you can prove the Jews are a nation. And this is part of why it was so attractive to Jewish nationalists. But they also had many other cultural reasons why they were attracted to Yiddish, because they wanted to create a modern secular culture in Yiddish. Now, they essentially argued that Yiddish was never a form of German. If it was ever a form of German, it separated from German long ago. But the main argument that came about by the early 20th century is that Yiddish is just the latest in a long chain of Jewish languages. As Jews migrate over time, they bring their old language with them, they enter a new territory, and drawing largely on the language spoken by non-Jews around them, they create a new language. 
The last position is what I'm calling the anti-Zionist position. And I'm putting it here in quotation marks because many of these scholars don't define themselves necessarily politically as anti-Zionist, or at least they argue that their political, their linguistic scientific conclusions are not based on politics. Now you can debate this, but I'm not interested in going into that now. The point is, this argument is often used by people to serve an anti-Zionist purpose, and sometimes to serve an anti to explicitly anti-Semitic purpose. Uh, the chief argument is that Yiddish is a relaxified Slavic language developed chiefly by Turkic and Slavic converts to rabbinic Judaism. That is that Yiddish begins as a Slavic language whose surface becomes Germanized, but the deep structure of the language, the grammar is essentially a Slavic language. That's why there are so many Slavic features to Yiddish grammar. But the vocabulary, which is really just superficial, changed over time. The Slavic words were largely pushed out and replaced with German sounding words. And the people who invented this language were not the descendants of the ancient Judeans, but they were converts to rabbinic Judaism, who were really mainly Turkic speakers and Slavic speakers, but not people who would define their ancestry as coming from the Middle East. Now, I'm gonna show all this to you in a bit more detail in a few minutes, but that's the basic outline. Now, our main historian, the classic historian of Yiddish is Max Weinreich, who lived from 1894 to 1969. He came from Kurland, which is a part of the Russian empire, outside the Pale settlement. He was actually a native German speaker, but he grew up in an environment where he was exposed to Yiddish from an early age and wholeheartedly adopted Yiddish by the time he was a teenager and really made it his life's cause and made the history of the Yiddish language his major work. He spent over 30 years working on this and was finally published shortly after his death. And that's what you see, it was published in 1973 by Yivo in New York. He was, by the way, the father of the famous Yiddish scholar and linguist Uriel Weinreich. Here you see a picture of Max with his two sons. Uriel is the older son on the right, on the left is Gabriel Weinreich, who became professor of physics. He still lives today in Michigan. He lived, he was a professor at the University of Michigan. Now, Weinreich's theory is really the classic theory of Yiddish. It's the theory that everybody has to contend with. Now, these maps, by the way, that I'm showing you now are taken from Tablet Magazine. The online magazine has a fantastic series of articles that I highly recommend to you about the origins of Yiddish and the controversies that are going to go into greater depth than I can give you here. Plus they don't talk about everything exactly that I'm talking about. I'm giving you a few other things, but it's a very good place to turn to. So Weinreich's theory is that Yiddish begins with Jews arriving in the Rhineland, the Rhine-Moselle Valley. This is what he calls the cradle of Ashkenazic Jewry. Where were they coming from? They're coming mainly from Northern France and from Italy. And therefore, they're bringing with them Jewish Romance languages, what you would call the Jewish correlates of Old French and Old Italian. For him, this explains the small number of Romance elegants, like you can take the name Yenta. Yenta, we know, is a name of probably of Italian origin, or Benchin, or the name Bunim, which corresponds to French Bonum. All right, there's a small number of Romance elements in uh, today's Yiddish. There were even more of them in the Western kind of Yiddish that's largely died out. He argues that Yiddish originates as a fusion of Semitic Romance and German elements or Germanic elements. The Semitic elements are chiefly coming through texts, through liturgy. Only later does Yiddish absorb Slavic elements because the Jews will migrate further eastward. But it starts off without the Slavic elements. They're incorporated more and more over time. Of course, the Slavic elements will give Yiddish a lot of its distinct coloration, not only uh, grammatically, but the sounds of Yiddish. You know, German speakers often have trouble, you know, in German, you can't begin a word normally with a sa. You begin with a za. Uh, German has soldaten and Yiddish has soldaten. Um, German does not have the za and the cha normally that Yiddish has. These are all, think of a word like chvok. These are all Slavic sounds that become quite common in Yiddish. So Yiddish speaking migrants moving eastward to Slavic territories find Jews there already. 
These are the pre ashkenazic Slavic speaking Jews, the Jews of what they used to call Canaan. They absorbed them, right? Uh, we get a lot of Slavic names in Yiddish because names are very conservative. They're passed along from generation to generation. So a lot of Slavic names are preserved in Yiddish. Some of them later get translated into Germanic or Yiddish, you might say. So for example, a name like uh, Zlata, which means gold, then becomes Golda in translation. And there are other examples of this. So this is all evidence of how the Ashkenazic Jews assimilate the Slavic speaking Jews, but traces of their heritage still are preserved. This German component of Yiddish results from a merger of various medieval dialects. It doesn't correspond to one dialect spoken by non-Jews. The Jews produce, you might say, a super regional form of German based on the various dialects in their fusion, plus these other elements. Now, it's a cardinal point for Weinreich that Jews never spoke identically with non-Jews. When they enter a new territory, they bring with them their previous language. They speak with a foreign accent. They bring with them Hebrew Aramaic. They never perfectly learn the language of the non-Jew because they're culturally different. It's not because they're ghettoized. It's because Jews have different cultural needs than non-Jews. Remember, this is a fundamentally religious world, Christians and Jews. Um, Jews sometimes borrow, of course, but they repurpose terms from non-Jews for their own purposes, and they avoid terms that have specifically Christian resonances. So you think of the word Yotzeit, uh, you know, anniversary for death. German Jahreszeit is a season of the year. It comes back, comes from medieval German. It has nothing to do with religion in contemporary German, but it has a specifically religious meaning for Jews. Uh, Jews do not use words like, um, uh, I'm trying to think, uh, words that have to do with, obviously, the words of the Trinity. Um, Jews do not, uh, they refer to the language, the writing of the non-Jews, by the term galchus, which has to do with the, a galach, a priest, and the, the tentured ones, and they, the monks would shave the tops of their heads. They did not know written literary German. And I could go on with many examples of words that exist in German, but don't have any parallel in Yiddish and vice versa, because clearly Jews were avoiding Christian connotations or they simply had different needs. So for Weinreich, it's this cultural distinctiveness that means that Jews never speak exactly like the non-Jews. Now for Weinreich, Western and Eastern Yiddish represent a linguistic continuum, right? The language spread from West to East. Now, there are a few problems that have been pointed out by scholars. Uh, for one thing, if there were about 35,000 Jews living in medieval Western Europe, how do we get close to 800,000 Jews by the 18th century in Eastern Europe? Now, first of all, we don't have precise numbers. This is all based on various scientific projections, a certain amount of census data in the 18th century, counting households, but not individual Jews. But we know this is a tremendous in, uh, increase over time. And this is one of the reasons why the Khazar hypothesis is attractive to many people. How do you explain so many Jews in Eastern Europe? Well, the answer is that Jews were coming from the Khazar Empire, which broke up in Central Asia around the 10th century, that these Jews went from Central Asia, Southern Russia, and Ukraine, and they simply moved up into Poland and other parts of Eastern Europe. Now we know very well, especially those who live in Canada, that you don't need the Khazars to explain this. About 6,000 settlers come to New France and Canada centuries ago. And today we have the Quebecois, which is a people of several million, right? People grow exponentially. The Quebecois had lots of children. Ashkenazic Jews grow very much in Eastern Europe, particularly in the last few centuries. In fact, you're probably familiar with the genetic problems of Ashkenazi Jews like Tay-Sachs that we believe had to do with a bottleneck problem, that there was a small founding population of Ashkenazi Jews uh, who then multiplied rapidly through the centuries, especially the 19th century, and this leads to a number of genetic difficulties. In fact, the leading theories about the genetic origins of Ashkenazi Jews have to do not with Khazars, which has been largely, disc largely discredited, but mainly with the idea that people coming from the Middle East, particularly men, made their way into Europe, and especially in Southern Europe, particularly today's Italy, they intermarried with locals. 
that the genetic origins of Ashkenazic Jewry are largely to be found in the intermixture of Middle Eastern Levantine genes and in Southern European genes. In fact, you know, Ashkenazic Jews, as far as we understand, don't have that much in common genetically with the people of Northern Europe that they later lived amongst. But this is all hotly debated. And who knows, 20 years from now, someone might decide otherwise about these genetic theories. Okay, uh, let me move on. Oh, there's one more point uh, has been pointed out. There's a problem with the correspondences. The German component of Yiddish has more to do with medieval Bavarian and other more Eastern dialects than the dialects of Western Germany. So these were challenges that are not quite explained by Max Weinreich's theory. More recent theory is what we call the Danube hypothesis. Now, there are several people who have contributed to this hypothesis, most prominently the scholar David Katz, who's probably the most prolific, the best known scholar of Yiddish nowadays. Um, Katz argues that communities from the Rhine and the Danube regions were independent. There were two areas of Jewish settlement, in other words. This latter group was not coming from France and Italy, they were really coming mainly from Slavic lands, a bit from Italy, the Balkans, the Middle East. They were probably speaking still Aramaic, plus some other languages. The language of those Jews in the Rhineland is not the ancestor of our Yiddish. In fact, it probably went extinct. And he has a number of linguistic arguments about this uh, that I won't take you through individually. The main point here is our Yiddish, Eastern Yiddish, comes from this more easternly form of spoken German dialects in the area perhaps of contemporary Regensburg in Germany, maybe even in bilingual Slavic German speaking territory, like what's today's Czech Republic. And this explains why there are so many Slavic elements early on. Even before the Jews get to Poland and Ukraine, there are already Slavic elements. Take a word like Nebuch. Nebuch probably goes, to old, goes back to Old Czech. So the origins are further east, but the basic idea is similar. The kind of fusion that I talked about, some of these Jews go eastward into Eastern Europe. Some of them go further west over time. Okay, but mainly they will go Eastern Europe. So it's a modification of Weinreich's theory, but it doesn't fundamentally challenge its basics. And the other theories about the Danube hypothesis do very similar things. They say in terms of the evidence, it makes more sense that the Ashkenazi Jews started further east, but still in German speaking or bilingual German Slavic speaking territory. The, there were Jews in Western Germany, but they did not contribute to the formation of Yiddish. Yiddish went from east, both west and further east. And that's why it's spoken in this continuum all the way from Alsace and France, all the way into Eastern Europe. Now, the most uh, controversial hypothesis is the so-called Sorbian hypothesis. And this goes back to what I was speaking about in the very beginnings with Paul Wexler. Now, Paul Wexler has a fascinating history. He's a linguist trained at Columbia who wrote his dissertation about language purism in Ukrainian and in Yiddish. He knows Slavic languages extremely well. He became later a professor at Tel Aviv University. Now his argument, and he's launched this first in the 1990s and he's revised it in various ways since, is that how do you explain the very Slavic structure of Yiddish? And I can't get into this for lack of time, but there are many elements of Yiddish, and I'm not talking about vocabulary, but elements of grammar. I'll, well, I'll try to give you an example uh, because I brought it up. Uh, you know, in Yiddish, you have this difference between is I read a newspaper. It doesn't tell you whether I read the newspaper to completion. It just tells you I read the newspaper or I was reading the newspaper in a certain context. Suggests I read it to completion. But this is a distinction that is systematic in Slavic languages, but is not systematic in Germanic languages. Um, Yiddish is full of this. I complete. Right? There's based on the way Slavic verbs work, Yiddish has calcs, it has translations, taking Germanic elements very often or Hebrew and Germanic elements and mimicking the, the structure of Slavic verbs. You can't do this the same way with German. 
that's just one example. How do you get this? Well, he would say, well, Yiddish began as a Slavic language spoken in Eastern Europe, in Eastern Germany. There were a number of Slavic languages, most notably Sorbian, which kind of died out by the early 20th century or became really diminished. We know that Sorbian speakers switched to German and retained often the structure of their Slavic language. The structure was replaced, was kept, but the, the, the superstructure, or rather the surface structure, I should say, the vocabulary became Germanic. Jews did this too, but they even resisted more. Whereas the Sorbian speakers finally gave in completely to German, the Jews held on to their Slavic language because they were not converting to Christianity and Germanization brought Christianity. The pagans converted and switched languages. The Jews held on to their religion and their language, but changed the vocabulary. Hence, Yiddish is really relaxified Sorbian. It's Judeo-Sorbian. And the speakers were largely the descendants of Slavs and Turks, people coming from this Khazar empire. Now, we know the Khazar empire was various peoples. It was people who were speaking Turkic languages. It was Slavs. It was perhaps people speaking forms of Persian. There is this old theory, there's a tradition that the elite of the Khazar empire converted to Judaism. Um, you read this in Yehuda HaLevi, for example, and there are a few other sources, but it's been widely disputed, if not debunked. There are some people who still believe it's true. Even if it's true though, we have no idea how much the Khazars converted. We don't know anything about their language or next to nothing about their language. We only really know about the Khazars from what other people wrote about them. So it's very hard to make any good arguments about the Khazars language and culture and how it had an impact on Yiddish. Uh, certainly, we don't see any real evidence for the Khazar impact on Yiddish. There is not a Turkic substratum, nor is there a Persian substratum in Yiddish. It simply doesn't really make sense from a linguistic demographic or genetic standpoint. Now, this theory, though, was picked up again, as I mentioned a few years ago, uh, this geneticist al Haik, together with uh, Paul Wexler and a few others, brought this argument. And here they took it to a new dimension with genetic research. They argued that the term Ashkenaz has to do with the names of villages in northern Turkey, that there are four villages in northern Turkey that have names that sound like Ashkenaz. The origins of Ashkenazic Jewry are not to be sought in Central Europe, rather they're to be sought in, Turkey, in, in uh, medieval Turkey along the Silk Route, along this massive trade route that linked basically Southeastern Europe, uh, the Middle East and China. That here you had people who were essentially converting from Judaism, converting to Judaism. They were again, a mixture of Turks, of Slavs and some other people, Persians, who created a new language, largely as a trade language, to disguise what they were doing from non-Jews. Now, this is really kind of preposterous in the views of most linguists, because you don't, you seldom do you create a whole language in order to exclude outsiders. There are trade jargons that people use sometimes so the clients won't hear. There's a language spoken in the early 20th century still in Germany, even perhaps the mid-century, where cattle dealers would use this as a trade jargon, using Yiddish or Hebrew elements, because there are so many Jews historically involved in the cattle trade in, in Germany that lots of Yiddish element, elements entered the jargon of cattle traders. Even when there were no more Jews or few Jews, they were still using this kind of speech. But it's not the language that you go home and speak to your wife and family in. Uh, people don't create new languages to deceive, to leave, to, you know, to exclude outsiders. On the, the genetic evidence is considered by most quite flimsy. And if you're interested, I can tell you more about this later in the Q&A, why it's considered flimsy. It's based on a very small sample pool. It's based on the notion of, we don't know much about the, who the Khazars are. So let's assume the Armenians, today's Armenians and today's um, Georgians are their descendants. Therefore, let's use their DNA. So there's a lot of problems with the genetics plus the genetic techniques used. So it was really discredited by contemporary scholars. But as I mentioned at the very beginning, it drew a lot of traction, particularly in certain circles, because it's very attractive for political purposes. If you can prove that Ashkenazic Jews are not the descendants of ancient Judeans, 
that if Yiddish is the language that was created by converse to Judaism, it's one more argument for those who use these kind of arguments to discredit Zionism by severing a Jewish connection from the land of Israel. Um, there are people who claim that's not their political purpose, they're not their motivation in making these arguments, but it's the main group that has picked up on these arguments. You'll often very still see the Khazar hypothesis on the internet and elsewhere, even though it's long been discredited by most scholars. Uh, by the way, this is simply the Silk Route. Silk Route. This is showing the idea that Yiddish was developed as a trade language amongst converts on the area of the Khazar Empire along the Silk Route centuries ago. I see I talked more than necessary, but I'm gonna stop there and I will be happy to expand and answer any of your questions. Fantastic comment, thank you so much. That was a lot of information um, and a, a lot of cross currents of information. So we have um, a few like fundamental questions, which I think perhaps are worth visiting. <clears throat> One of them has to do with simply the term emancipation. Uh, what what uh, what does uh, emancipation mean? Can you maybe explain that to, sure. to folks who don't have an idea what that is? So um, I'm going to try to give you this in the brief version, not yeah. the, the history professor yeah. version. Right. Um, <laughs> it's one of the central <clears throat> questions of modern Jewish history. Uh, Jews do not have equal rights in European countries until the 19th century. France is the first country in, 17, in the late 18th century to emancipate its Jews, making them citizens with equal rights. Of course, you had to make everybody citizens with equal rights and not all non-Jews had equal rights yet, but they were given equal rights and then Jews had to be given <clears throat> equal rights too because you can't leave them out, right? You either have to make them citizens or you have to kick them out essentially. This was the arguments. And these debates were going on throughout the 19th century. What do we do with our Jews? Do we give them equal rights? Do we make, treat them as foreigners living amongst us as we have previously, or do we expel them? Uh, the last countries to emancipate their Jews are the Soviet Union in 1917, and I believe Romania. Uh, they were the holdouts into the 20th century. Tsarist Russia had no interest in emancipating anyone, least of all its Jews. So emancipation basically means making citizens with equal rights. And then the other basic question was, could you, <clears throat> once again, if you have already, uh, define relexified? Okay, so relexified. <laughs> uh, so lexicon, of course, means vocabulary. Um, relexification, and this is, a, this is a phenomenon that actually happens. You know, Paul Wexler is a brilliant scholar. There are many objections to what he, he argues, but he's talking about linguistic processes that we know have happened even if they haven't happened in the case we're talking about. There are cases where a language's structure is one type of language, but the actual vocabulary changes over time. Um, I'll just give you an example, and this will be a mild case perhaps. We know that English is a Germanic language. Its structure is Germanic, but so much of our vocabulary is no longer Germanic, right? You read Old English, it sounds like German. Uh, if once you get to Chaucer and then you know, beyond, it's full of these French words, um, right? So relaxification means basically changing the vocabulary without changing the structure of the language. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, so another fundamental question. So if you are today getting a DNA test and it comes back that you are 98% or 100% Ashkenazi Jew, right? So what does that really mean? Do you have any idea? Like, what is the definition of Ashkenaz according to those doing these? these yeah, this is this tests? is all very, I would argue, very dangerous water. Um, <laughs> it was suggested a few years ago that the state of Israel start using genetic testing for the purposes of immigration by Jews, right? A short, if you're in doubt, you don't have documents, you can't prove your Jewish descent, get a genetic test, and you become, you know, you'd be subject to the law of return. You can become a citizen of Israel quickly. And of course, there was a backlash to racially genetically defined Jews. This is precisely what the Nazis tried to do to us. Plus, there are many Jews who say, I'm a convert to Judaism, right? Um, there's no shame in that either. We, rabbinic Judaism never argued 
that Jews are all the descendants biologically of the ancient Judeans. We've always known there are people who join the Jews and they're just as welcome, right? Of course, they become assimilated over time and they forget their origins, they just become Jews. Um, when you get these genetic tests, you know, first of all, the algorithms are always developing, they're changing over time, they're getting more and more accurate, but they're based on sample pools and self-identification. So I'll give you an example of, of me. My, my lineage is, I'm, my father's family is Ashkenazi. My mother's family are Romagnol Jews from Greece. The small group of Jews that very few people know about. Is there a test for Romagnol lineage? Can we identify it the way we can identify Ashkenazi lineage? Well, we know there's a hell of a lot of Ashkenazi Jews have been tested and we can identify certain patterns associated with those people. Uh, and what, when you get an Ashkenazi test, it says, okay, you're, you're, you're identifiable as being related to all these other people who identify as Ashkenazi Jews. There's no, nothing inherent about being Ashkenazi. There's no specific Ashkenazi chromosome. You know, this in the same way that, you know, Ashkenazi Jewry is a cultural complex. Before these Jews were Ashkenazi, they were the Jews of France or the Jews of Italy or the Jews of somewhere else. So it tells us part of the story but can never tell you some kind of fine points of origins. Um, you know you're related to other Ashkenazi Jews. With Sephardic, Romagnot, and other Jews, I think the testing, at least the, the popular testing open to the commercial market is not as, less, as well developed. Uh, I don't think they'll tell you yet, yet most of these tests, you're Romagnot, you're Sephardic, or so on and so forth. They tell me that my ancestry is, not a big surprise, Southern European, North African, West Asian, and then 50% Ashkenazi. But these Ashkenazi Jews, if you ask anyone who knows genetics, they'll tell you the Ashkenazic Jewish profile also contains a Middle Eastern, Western Asian component. So, you know, you have to take this a step back. You have to unravel the thread. Right, right. Thank you for that. That, that was very helpful. Um, do you know whether Luntz was influenced by Moses Mendelssohn in uh, basically rejecting Yiddish as, as a language that should be spoken by Jews in favor of, of uh, German and other national languages? Sure. Yeah, I mean, essentially, uh, the entire movement of the Jewish Enlightenment favored Jews abandoning Yiddish, which they saw as a barrier to cultural integration and they saw it as an impure language because of its mixed nature and embracing the language, the dominant language of state and society. So 19th century German thinkers were absolutely influenced by the Haskalah, the Jewish enlightenment. Um, but to single out Mendelssohn, you know, Mendelssohn is one of many, he's the most prominent. This is the general current in 19th century Central and Western Europe. You know, it's, um, people like to point to the, these people often as bad guys. Uh, because they said what's from a contemporary standpoint, a lot of absurd, absurd things. You know, Sun said something like uh, Yiddish, speaking Yiddish is an, as an animal language that contributes to the corrupt thinking of Jews. Mendelssohn had many negative things to say about Yiddish. Of course, it was his mother tongue, as it was Sun's mother tongue. Mendelssohn wrote to his wife in Yiddish all the time. You know, how could you have corrupt thoughts only in Yiddish, but not in German. No, it's absurd, right? Um, but they were fighting against something we take for granted. We're emancipated, we're integrated, it's, but these were very difficult times for them. And you have to you know, take this in a sense in that context. Uh, their ideas were backwards by contemporary standards, but need to be understood in this context of Jewish rightlessness and the need to prove that Jews were human beings as well as Jews. Uh, Later on, the Jewish nationalists, the Yiddishists, said, we don't need to prove that we're human beings. We already we know we're human beings, and we deserve rights specifically as Jews. But that was an evolution that took time to happen. Thank you. Uh, so there was a, another question. So you, you, you introduced a number of theories, uh, hypotheses about the origins of, of Yiddish language. And so one question is, to which hypothesis do you subscribe and why? <laughs> uh, you know, I don't think this question will ever be fully solved because it's impossible. You know, uh, these kinds of origins of language questions are impossible wholly to solve. Um, it's interesting. I'm not sure we need to solve it. Um, 
But of course, you know, I tend to side with, side with the Weinreich school of thought, whether in some modified form. Um, you know, either the Danube, maybe the Danube hypothesis, something like this. Clearly, Yiddish, to my stamp, from my standpoint, it's clearly a Germanic language. Uh, it originates in German-speaking territory. German-speaking territory is very broad. People think of German Germany as the place where German begins. And there's a standard German language. We forget that German was a bunch of dialects spoken across a wide swath of territory into Eastern Europe, just like Yiddish is. Um, only over time does a standardized German language develop. So, you know, it's somewhere in the Central European context that Yiddish originates. And that's good enough for me. I absolutely reject the, the Slavic uh, Sorbian and Khazar theories. I think I've, you know, I think I've made that clear. They just strike me as kind of absurd, even though exploring them raises important questions. They bring up holes in the, in the classical theories of Yiddish. They're productive to explore, but I wouldn't abide by them by any means. Perhaps some Khazar Jews entered the fold of the Ashkenazi Jews. That's completely probable, plausible, but certainly they're not the major, how shall I say, the uh, reservoir that of Ashkenazi Jewry. It's pretty clear that Ashkenazi Jewry is migrating from Central Europe into Eastern Europe. Sorry, I'm muted because my dog has been speaking. Um, well, somebody asked a question about uh, something that actually I wind up teaching uh, from what I understood about the origins of Yiddish uh, is whether during the Roman occupation of Judea, right, when Jews were captured and sent to Rome as slaves, uh, did they then migrate to France and Germany to form an Ashkenazi core of Jews? Is that part so, of the theory? As I mean, well? this is a this is self. You know, all we have so little documentation about some of this stuff. We know certainly Jews come, Jews live in the Roman Empire. It's already there in the New Testament. Uh, you don't have to go, you know, and study the entire history of, of Roman policy. We know that J Jews live in the Mediterranean area. They, they make their way throughout the Roman Empire. We know that Jews are probably the first group to, to establish the city of modern day Cologne in Germany. Um, in the medieval era. Um, Jews from various parts of what were Roman territory do make their way into what's Germany. That's absolutely clear. They're coming of diverse provenance. And this is part of what makes it complicated because some of them are coming from places like France and uh, you know Italy. Some of them are clearly coming up into the Balkans and then moving west. So you know the the origins of Ashkenazi Jewry are most likely quite diverse in their you know their provenance, but the linguistic cultural origins you know what makes Ashkenazi Jews Ashkenazi Jews right they speak Yiddish they pray in a certain way uh, you know they wait so much time between milk and meat even though there's actually differences amongst Ashkenazi Jews right they only marry one wife right Max Weinreich will tell you the beginnings of Ashkenaz is when um, this famous rabbi declared that um, when Rabbi Gershon declares that, you know, Ashkenazi Jews, you should only marry one wife. This is the Declaration of Independence. Well, you know what? No one declared independence at this time. Uh, later on, we, retroactively, we can say, OK, the Ashkenazi Jews started doing this, or at least thought it was important to, to make this official before other Jews. Other Jews may have been doing it already, but not have publicized it. Maybe it spread to other Jews. But, you know, it's very hard to say when do the Ashkenazi Jews actually begin? You know, I tell my students, um, when did the first, when do the, when do you get your first Canadian Jews? And they all tell me, because they've studied this, the first Jews arrive in Canada in year X, and they were coming from place Y. And I say to them, were they Canadian Jews? What do you mean? Well, did they see themselves as Canadian? Did they identify with this landscape? And the answer is, if you think about it, it probably took a few generations before they felt Canadian in a way that was distinct from some other identity. It takes a while before the Ashkenazi Jews stop seeing themselves as the Jews of France, Italy, or some other region and say, you know what, we're the Ashkenazi Jews, or other people look at them and say, you know what, those are the Jews of Ashkenaz. But absolutely, there's a tie to the Roman Empire in some, in some way or, or form. <clears throat> okay. Well, um, we have a few more questions, but 
I think this is a moment then we need to stop. Um, so uh, if you have other questions, uh, I don't know, perhaps we can have you respond to them privately, Kalman? Sure. Would you want to entertain that? Can you, do you want to put You mean email? right now, if you spend a few more minutes right now, or do you mean sending me an email? Maybe sending you uh, an email, if, if that's okay. Is that okay with you? Uh, sure, I'll do my best to answer questions, sure. Okay. <laughs> as long as it doesn't take me writing a book. Right. <laughs> Maybe no, I can recommend exactly. a book to read. Right, right. Because, because there are some broad questions about how different is Yiddish from German and, and uh -huh. uh, you know, stuff like that. I think that those, those are bigger, bigger questions which we're not yes. going to uh, respond wait for, to. Wait for my book. <laughs> there you go, exactly. <laughs> So, uh, so again, everyone, thank you so very much for joining us. Thank you so much, Kalman, Dr. Weiser, for your excellent presentation. Really, just so packed with uh, wonderful information uh, for all of us, and definitely will help my teaching down the road. Uh, so, really, really uh, appreciate that. And. Um, you know, come come join us in March, March 13th for our next presentation, uh, which I'm sure will be just as fascinating and, and useful for all of us. So thank you again. And uh, if you wa want to stay and read some of the what's happening in the chat, there's some fantastic uh, comments, uh, a lot of a lot of thank yous. I don't know if you see that, Kalman. Yes, I'm getting them. I'd like to thank everybody for coming. I, I really do appreciate it. Uh, I don't take it for granted that you're making your time to listen to me rant and rave about the origins of Ashkenazic <laughs> Jewry. Uh, I'm very passionate about it, and I'm always excited to share it with other people. Yeah, and we feel your passion, and it it uh, it definitely uh, translates to all of us, even even as.